The um, Worthies signatories, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Uh, Worthies uh, have got together and petitioned a whole series of political leaders uh, to not proceed with the proposed international jet airport at Terrace, central Otago. Now, just to give you a little bit of background to that, the central Otago, Queenstown, Wanaka, for example, we're talking about tourist attractions this morning, Queenstown would probably be New Zealand's premier tourist attraction in terms of a destination to go to. Uh, and it's become even more popular um, in the last 20 years. They have an airport that services Queenstown, and for those of you who have never been here, it's based at Frankton, which um, is surrounded essentially by residential housing um, developments. It's got a school a new school there, Wakatapu High School, which is there as well. And it's tried to expand, but because of all that approximate housing um, and retail, um, being denied that opportunity. So really it's, 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 it's at its peak capacity, you'd have to say now, for jet aircraft to fly into. It's actually also quite a dangerous destination. So I think um, along with Wellington... It rates as one of the destinations in New Zealand that you don't want to fly into, particularly when the crosswinds blow, and they do. Uh, I've had a few white knuckle entries myself. Wanaka, for those... So, uh, where are you going to fly into if you can't fly into Queenstown and it's restricted? There was a thought of putting all your international flights into um, Queenstown and putting all domestic flights into Wanaka, which would require an expansion of the Wanaka Airport. But overwhelmingly, um, the locals at Wanaka said, we don't want an expansion of our airport. We want our peace and quiet. We don't want to be on a f uh, flight path. And because most of the people in Wanaka have a lot of money, and they do, and a, a degree, a significant degree of political influence, um, they pretty much got their way. So that's not a goer as well. Into this, the Christchurch International Airport, uh, about four or five years ago, uh, decided that there was an opportunity, a market opportunity for them. So they looked at the flat land in central Otago that would be able to be large enough to accommodate a significant international airport. That, And they Christchurch International Airport did it. In essence, I, I would suggest to you probably as a, 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 an astute commercial decision, recognising that if they didn't do it, somebody else might, and that that would take revenue and customers away from them in Christchurch. So there was a bit of um, forward planning, if you like, as well by Christchurch. Now, the idea is that there would be an international airport um, centred around Terrace, it's about 30 kilometres north, is it north? Yes, north of Cromwell. And roughly about the same um, from Wanaka. So it's sort of equidistant to the two. Uh, and it's on really the only available flat land, which has always been the problem. Where can I fly into that's flat land um, to accommodate wide-bodied jet engine aircraft? Um, now, as a result of that, there has been a bit of toing and froing. It's uh, there have been the NIMBY people, uh, understandably, people who live there saying we don't want to. Um, but I can also say there's a great deal of support uh, amongst the political leadership in the Central Otago region, who know very well um, of the economic opportunities that that would provide to the region and the growth opportunities, particularly um, for a place like Cromwell, um, which is uh, growing. I have to say, like Topsy, as I speak at the moment. Now, um, as I said, uh, introducing this before, uh, a group who call themselves informed leaders, uh, 10 academics, um, none of whom I don't think live in central Otago, have put out a, um, uh, if you like, a, 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 a demand, no, uh, a request, um, suggesting that they are some of New Zealand's most experienced researchers with expertise in the fields of business economics um, climate scientists, sustainability, Maori and Indigenous studies, tourism, the environment, agriculture and policy studies, 
and it's the shared view of the undersigned uh, that the proposed Terrace Airport should not proceed. Uh, joining us to talk about that is one of those, uh, distinguished Professor Robert McLaughlin, a Fellow of the Royal Society of New Zealand. And thank you very much for joining us. Um, thank first, you. Thank you, Michael. First of all, what on earth is a distinguished professor and how do you um, associate it from somebody who's not distinguished? You know, it's um, one of those little academic titles. I don't know how much that means, um, but uh, I was a, uh, uh, my actual background is in mathematics and scientific computing, um, sort of large scale simulations, and uh, from that moved into the uh, climate change area, and uh, that's how I that's how I got interested in the in the Terrace Airport issue. Um, and most of you, I think, yes, all of you are located in universities, but I don't think any of you live here. Um, do you think it's a little infradig, um writing to decision makers in the area saying, don't go ahead with the airport without discussing it with locals first? So there has been a lot of um, you know, media attention, um, a lot of and agitation by locals. Uh, some of whom you could describe as NIMBYs, as you did in the intro, which is uh, you know, fair enough in some cases. Um, so there have been environmental campaigns against the Terrace Airport. Um, so the new thing with our one, well, first off, uh, we're academics, so we're hoping to shine more of an academic light on it and look at what the research says. Um, but also we think this is really a, like a national issue. Building a new international airport for the long range wide bodies jets that will affect the whole of New Zealand for a very, very long time to come. And it really should be looked through a, a national lens as well as the local lens that you, you highlighted in your intro there, which, which is important. Um, the primary reason though, that the 10 academics of which you are included um, oppose the airport is from a global carbon emissions point of view. Uh, and I guess if I was to follow your logic, you wouldn't want any more aircraft, you want less aircraft already than are flying into New Zealand. So there's two things. Um, the whole aviation industry uh, in New Zealand and globally, it, it does have an issue with its emissions um, and it does have to be addressed and we're only just starting to do that now really. Um, so, for example, um, the UN last year um, agreed to what they call an aspirational goal that aviation should be reached net zero by 2050. So that's a, that's a bit of progress at the international level. But no one has worked out how to do that yet. Um, so go, uh, in the, <clears throat> until, until some sort of plan is in place, going full step ahead with growth, um, we've been on a very, very rapid growth, growth target for aviation in New Zealand until some sort of plan or idea how we're going to manage that is in place, doing a large investment in something that would increase emissions is, is not a good idea. But does saying. it follow? Um, I'm reading this morning of the latest uh, experiments into having electric um, be powered uh, aircraft jetliners. Now, I realise that that might be 30 years away, but that's when they are talking about putting the airport uh, uh, there. We know that technology flourishes um, when humans are stressed to find technological solutions. Does it follow that necessarily building a new airport in 2050, which is what, almost 30 years away from now, would necessarily increase, in, in, uh, increase global emissions of carbon when there are alternative fuel sources being investigated as we talk? Yeah, yeah. Um it doesn't necessarily follow, but there's a lot of uncertainty. So if we had, for example, an agreement to have a gradually falling cap on um, fossil fuel use in aviation, then it, c it could make sense to uh, expand aviation if we knew how we were going to do it sustainably. Um, and in fact, the, the, the Christchurch Airport who wants to build tariffs in their publicity material, they talk a lot about electric planes and this exciting new technologies on the horizon. Um, well, the, those technologies do not exist yet. And I think we will see some small electric planes maybe in the 2030s. So 
uh, like Blenheim, Picton to, to Wellington, that would be a prime target for such a thing. They're going to be small planes with very short ranges. Um, the technology isn't isn't there yet. Um, so there will be new technology. There will also be some uh, lower emission fuels called sustainable aviation fuels. But those things by themselves, enough for the huge growth that the aviation industry wants to wants to see. But don't you think that it's putting the cart before the horse? I mean, what you're suggesting is stop now. So don't do anything more. I mean, that's what oh, I've read your uh, your letter. But uh, the other s- s- stage, um, surely uh, an international airport, when you're trying to meet international demand, can plan ahead and assume that the technology will be there. I mean, in other words, you, yeah, you're yeah, denying the, the opportunity yeah. for Christchurch to do some forward planning. Um, they'll have to deal with international agreements by 2050. I'm sure there'll be international agreements. I'm sure there'll be national commitments in New Zealand by 2050. So they'll have to exist within those anyhow. What's the problem with them doing some preparatory work now? Yeah, and that and that planning uh, should be done um, with as, and as wide a possible as focus and really on a national level, not just by uh, the such. I mean, it's not really a private company, it's a, a state-owned company, essentially, um, who may have an incentive to, um, in fact, raise emissions rather than lowering them. So there's a tension there between um, what the environment needs, what the country as a whole needs in terms of our emissions, and what an airport would like to do. The airport currently doesn't take any responsibility for the emissions of the plane. So they're talking themselves up as a, you know, a green airport, and... Christchurch Airport himself is in fact carbon neutral, which is, is brilliant. They're a world leader at that. But that's only if you don't count the planes. So building airports definitely uh, it, uh, grows emissions. That's the basic problem. Um, well, the next point is you say that you're not, as a group, anti-airport, anti-aviation, anti-business or anti-development. But it's not just the climate action and carbon emissions that you concern you, are you? Because you're also talking about, and I quote, the potential impact of this proposed airport on Central Otago's environment, flora and fauna, strain on regional infrastructure, impact on local and regional communities, wider economic consequences, intergenerational impacts and the well-being of those mm. living locally. Um, mm. When did you talk to us? I live here and I'm a local leader. Uh, before you decided that it wasn't good for us. Well, this is uh, your your uh, Natago Regional Councillor. So all of these things that you've just mentioned, those are very much on your plate already, right? Uh, so you're already or any kind of development, you're already attempting to weigh up uh, the, you know the costs and the different interests, of people, the winners and losers, and so on. Yeah, but uh, I mean, that, as, that you, as you're as you're probably well aware, this, this professor. This is a particularly big one. Yeah, but as you're probably well aware, professor. Um, anything like a new airport is going to have to go through planning permission. It's going to have to meet um, a series of standards, um, whether they are nationally imposed or regional in terms of plans, which would include effect upon the environment and things like that. Again, I'm asking you, is this premature? Um, Surely if the Otago Regional Council and councils and environmentalists and uh, local community leaders and the like have an input into whether or not permission is granted under the Resource Management Act currently or whatever its replacement will be, that's where these issues can be resolved, no? Well, you've, uh, you've raised an important point there because the entire framework for um, deciding on large projects like this um, is in the process of being changed. Um, so for a long time, for example, uh, the decision makers, like yourself, were not allowed to take... Um, climate change into account in approving or declining a project and we don't know yet what the new framework is going to look like. So I would say the people who were premature were Christchurch Airport in um, doing all the work on this project before any framework for addressing aviation emissions is in place. Um, Um, I I, I guess I could add one thing that um, the government is now starting to look at how we might deal with aviation emissions. There's this new group called Sustainable Aviation Aotearoa has just been formed. Um, So it will be very interesting to see 
how they would approach this issue. Do you think it's a good idea New Zealand deciding to go alone on this issue rather? I mean, international aviation is by the very definition international in, in, its, in its impact. Um, and do you think it's an idea that we wait for some sort of international agreement on aviation emissions before we make these sorts of decisions? Yeah, so that, that's a good point. Um, New Zealand tends to be a little bit of a follow-up, but um, in the last few years, the picture has changed very rapidly. So the climate meeting in Glasgow about a year ago, uh, a group on aviation was formed and New Zealand joined it. And now we do have this agreement at the UN. Um, but what that agreement says is each country should go away and um, come up with a plan, tell us how they're going to deal with this issue. So um, that's, where, that's where things have reached at the moment. And finally, um, um, yeah, yeah. in terms of uh, engaging uh, with folk on this particular issue, I'm going to ask a question that I asked. Uh, I gave an analogy at the start of this program. You're probably old enough to remember the Citizens for Rolling campaign. Do you, do you remember that? I remember, uh, I remember seeing Bill rolling on the telly. I must have been quite little. <laughs> All right. Well, the Citizens for Rolling campaign um, was a, a, a group of worthies, very similar to yourself, who got together saying, vote for this man and don't vote for the other person. And there was a resentment from the wider community that a group of worthies had got together, pronounced themselves as such, and were seeking to lecture um, to uh, others as to the decision that should be made. Do you think there's a possible backlash from people who might consider that um, this is not your area and you are seeking to impose your political views upon a community that hasn't actually had the opportunity to form an opinion yet? Um, well, we're not going to impose our views because we don't have any power to do that. Um, I, I think the problem is the opposite. I think there are too many university academics in, in this country and probably elsewhere who don't speak out enough. They know what the academic literature is saying, but it's... Um, a little bit stuck in the journals and inside the ivory tower and uh, yeah i would very much like to see more academics speaking out so what next after this you've written to chris hipkins as the prime minister and um and carmel cipolloni um to the christchurch city council and their various um, organizations to central otago uh, and to the otago regional council um are you expecting them to formally reply to you or uh, is this just a little bit of noise that they will deal with by just ignoring? Well of course the, yeah, the change in the leadership and the cabinet that does complicate things a bit so we'll see who the new um, relevant ministers are uh, and then we will attempt to meet with them. Um, I guess the conversation at the moment is it's really been a little bit confined to the Christchurch Airport putting out their side of the story and then some um, protesters um, complaining about it. That, so we're trying to enlarge it both so we bring in the academic research and also trying to look at the, the long-range national issues. That's what we're trying to do. Right. So, in essence, this is, this is, is this the start of a campaign, I guess is what I'm saying to you? Um, if yeah, yeah, exactly. And we'll also be um, build, building up as time goes on um, sort of an archive of what the academic research is, is saying on this issue. Right. Um, and finally, you say that we are the sixth highest emitter of aviation emissions per capita in the world. That's not really our fault, is it? It's because we're so far away from the markets that want to visit us, yeah? Uh, yeah, it's a whole lot of things. Um, it's, the, it's the large tourist industry. It's the location, as you said. It's the large tourist industry, which we've been very focused on growing as much as possible. Um, and then we've also got what they call the love mile. So we've got um, a quarter of the population was born overseas. So those people have families overseas that they might want to visit. And then you've got all the New Zealanders living overseas um, who, who have family here. So all of those things contribute. Well, and also it's New Zealanders who have a wanderlust. So it's part of, it seems, mm. our cultural identity that we travel. Do you see the, mm. I mean... <laughs> You can see where I'm going on this one, can't you? Um, the logic of what you're saying is that you don't want to see any more people coming to New Zealand. Um, in fact, you've said that the model we've got for tourism now is quantity, not quality driven. So the suggestion is 
that it's already reached saturation point. But we've got New Zealanders flying out overseas on a regular basis as part of our cultural identity. Um, are you intending to have a go at those people and trying to limit yeah. their aviation needs and lusts? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> I'm afraid I am. So the problem there is it's the growth. So people flying more and more frequently and the frequent flying, especially the very long distance frequent flying. So um, 10 or 20 years ago, you know, people might go to uh, well-off middle class, people might go to Europe every five years or 10 years or something. And now there's a lot of people who would go to Europe every year. Uh, there's people who go to Australia, you know, once a month. Uh, and that is not, um, that level of emissions is just not compatible with what we need to do on, on climate well, change. Well, my daughter, for example, is going, she's uh, just left school. She's year 13. She's in a gap year um, this year, actually. It started already. Um, and she's flying out to um, uh, see her friend in Thailand in, in April. Um, mm -hmm. At what point do you say to people like her, is that trip really necessary? That's an excellent question, and uh, it really applies to all of us. We're all basically all in all in the same boat on this one. Um, especially people like me, who in the you know the middle part of their career, I did fly a lot for my work, going to conferences and things. And um, we are now trying to stop. We are now trying to, just speaking for myself and the academic community, we are trying to stop people flying to conferences, for example. So I think that. The, the, the young Kiwi and the Wanderlust thing, that will continue, um, but not, hopefully, not with the very frequent flying back and forth that we're, some people have become used to. So, just popping across the Tasman for the school holidays or something like that? Exactly, yep. Uh, so, so, if you look at the International Visitor Surveys, um, they ask people, why are you visiting New Zealand? How many times have you been here before? And so on. There are people who have been been here a hundred or two hundred times. They're dead frequent flyers by by any definition. Right. Um, and well, which leads you to the next thing. So your aim is to reduce aviation um, until new technology might ensure that the same emissions are not being produced. Is your aim suasive? In other words, you wish to persuade people to change their behaviour? Or do you think that there is a point at which you need to be able to impose that behaviour by regulation or legislation? I think it's both. So yes, there is this, there is a movement of people voluntarily uh, flying less just to do reduce their uh, personal emissions and do the right thing from the environment, and that can build support to um, to get some kind of regulation in place. Um, I have to say it's a very challenging issue because you've got the the international angle. Um, uh, where there is no technological solution for the long flights and you have to get all the countries to agree and so on, but we are starting to see a, see a movement on that. Yes, you might tangle in the high wires on seeking to reduce individual freedoms of New Zealanders who want to travel, though, I assume, Professor. Look, I, I don't think it's going to be a matter of restricting freedom. It's this, um, I mean, look at the, the opposite side, which is what's happening now, is people are basically changing their behaviour to adopt lifestyles which involves more and more frequent long distance flying. Um, so when you say we're aiming to reduce aviation, I guess the first goal is to slow down the very rapid growth, because that will only make the problem harder in the future to deal with. All right, thank you very much for joining us. Mm -hmm. I appreciate sure. your time and um, I hope that we'll talk again uh, about the progress yeah. or otherwise that you might have made on this issue. Thank you, Professor. Yeah, and I appreciate that you know you are on the regional council, and so this this may very well come onto your desk one day. Indeed, it may. Thank you so much. Um, that is Professor Rob, a uh, distinguished professor, um, Robert McLaughlin from the School of Mathematical and Computational Sciences at Massey University. He'd be interested in your response to the issues he's raising because they are a lot more, and that's why I had Professor uh, McLaughlin on the show this morning. They are a lot more than just about whether or not there's going to be an international tour, um, jet airport at Taras in central Otago. The issues that these 10 academics have, um, have raised, and these are 10 very high-profile distinguished academics from a variety of universities in New Zealand, uh, 
much greater, as you would have heard later on in that interview. And your thoughts on that one? 